Shabbat Shalom, men. If everyone would please lift their hands in prayer. <clears throat> Most holy and righteous Father Yahweh in heaven, uh, this is Khan Kanaf Hawkins, the seed of your anointed servant Yisrael, the great Khan Yisrael Abel Hawkins, and by and through the authority of Yahshua Messiah, the great, the most honorable high priest, our judge, and soon coming king, uh, asking and praying, Father Yahweh, that you would receive uh, each and every one of us here in prayer uh, on this, uh, the seventh day of the week, the Holy Sabbath day, uh, the first day of the fourth moon of Melchizedek, as we come before you in this Sabbath uh, afternoon class, uh, we pray for your inspiration and your guidance continually, and that you would strengthen us in keeping this day uh, righteous and holy before you. And it's all by and through the authority of Yahshua Messiah, I pray, as a seed of your anointed servant, Yeshua, being guided by Spirit Holy, hallelujah, Yahweh, praise Yahweh. Please be seated. We're going to go ahead and start now. And, uh, and I welcome everybody to the Sabbath afternoon uh, workshop class. We're going to start in the 20th book of Yisrael, He Who Rules is Yahweh, and it's subtitled, It is Written. Okay, and so we're going to be in this, um, the beginning of this book. Uh, what I'm going to do is, um, of course, there's a dedication. Now, uh, in the page before the dedication, uh, uh, with the uh, letter J, uh, Pastor, um, well, there's a quote in here from out of this book uh, uh, in, the, in chapter 37, verse 5. Uh, Pastor says, Yahweh says in Isaiah 45, turn to me for the answers for salvation. That's Isaiah 45. You should read that whole chapter, you know, speaking of chapter 45 of Isaiah. That chapter is about the house of Yahweh being reestablished. How do we know that the house of Yahweh is the one? Yahshua said, it is written. It is written. It's prophesied. It's a written contract between us and Yahweh. Uh, get that. No one can foretell the future except Yahweh himself. He says it, and he's proved it over and over and over. And, of course, if you're taking notes, uh, that's chapter 37 of this book, verse 5. Now, we're going to go ahead and start in chapter 1. Uh, it's entitled, The Allotted Time, 6,000 Years to Satan and Mankind, is in its last three and a half years, the end. Now, this sermon was given on the... Uh, First Roman month, uh, the 11th day of 2020, uh, and um, it was the uh, Hebrew day, um, Isaiah 15. Okay, so Pastor starts off, you know, shalom everyone, and, and uh, he says it's beautiful, beautiful looking at all of the people, and he says uh, it's a beautiful white Sabbath. So undoubtedly it was a day that uh, we had uh, snow. Uh, the peace of Yahweh be with uh, each and every one of you. And uh, now one of the things I wanted to kind of cover before we get into the sermon is that this is a sermon, when you read it, he's talking about everything that we have just come out of in this last feast of uh, Pentecost. Because if you'll remember what the theme was for the feast of Pentecost, it was fighting disunity. Okay, now... This sermon is all about coming into unity and everything that is required of us as a people to come into unity with Yahweh's laws, the prophecies, his uh, last day's witness, his spokesman, and each other. You know, this is something that we must come to in order to be ready to be a useful tool in Yahweh's house. Now, Pastor goes on there, and, and again, this is in the beginning of the sermon, he says, uh, if you just think about it, next month, which is not too far off, the Mortons will be here. So he's talking about the Purple Mortons. And uh, those are the Purple Mortons, and, and of course they get here, and he was speaking before the uh, Feast of, uh, of Passover. Uh, now going down, uh, he's, uh, he's in verse 3. And he's talking about a part of this prophesied time period, the last three and a half years. 
in a way of uh, hurt not the oil, that uh, scripture and revelation. Okay, and Pastor says, uh, let me start here with all this dominance that, the, that they're warning, speaking of all of the governments of the land. Uh, you saw that last part of the news and you heard what he was saying about the pipeline between Russia and Turkey. Uh, that weans out the United States. I said it long before they did, and keep that in your mind. You know, Pastor has always brought forth these things before we see them as a world event. And he says, I, I said it long before they did. Revelation said it in 96. It said in 96 AY, hurt not the oil. That's what the fight starts over. That's what Revelation chapter 6 and 9 show you. What we're seeing now is the great conflict. And it's a continuous conflict, of course, that we know and understand is going to lead up to this last seventh plague. And, of course, that will be utter destruction. Um, now, if you look down in verse 4, he's reading articles now. And he talks about NATO, the Pope's army. They're drilling for oil. They're drilling for it. And, of course, the article goes on to say that they were drilling, you know, in, in the way of their large-scale war uh, drills. But like Pastor says, these guys have been reading our literature. They're drilling not for peace, but for large-scale war. That's the headline on this article right here. And if you go down in verse 5, he talks about further in another article uh, uh, in which the Russian uh, general made a comment about NATO. And, and, of course, we know that NATO is the Pope's army. And, uh, you know, Pastor goes on to say they're preparing, you know, for this major conflict. They're not preparing for peace. The only organization on the earth that's preparing for peace is the house of Yahweh. Okay, um, now going further down, if you look, um, let's see here, let's go to verse 8. And Pastor says, NATO, here's another one with Trump involved. And of course, at that time, uh, uh, President Donald Trump was the president of the United States. And he says, here's another one with Trump involved. NATO plus ME, which ME standing for the Middle East, uh, that ME is Trump and includes Middle East. It's the two shaking hands, uh, NATO and the Middle East, and of course Trump, the United States being involved. All the rest of you, you, you get out of here, you know, and that's the way the governments of the world look. You know, I, I mean, everything is about lust and greed, and of course, that's what brings forth these wars that we see so prevalent today. Um, now, uh, further down, uh, in verse 9, Pastor says, uh, uh, Trump in the Middle East, the president's suggestion came one day after he issued a vague call for more NATO involvement in the Middle East, and of course, you know, he's, he's further expounding upon the fact that if you look in verse 10, uh, there Trump discussed his phone call the day before with NATO Secretary General, whom Trump des described as excited about the prospect of a Middle East expansion. And now he talks about the Middle East expansion, of course, including uh, the country of Israel. Um, now, down there in verse um, uh, 12, uh, Pastor says, Trump said it's M.E. and NATO. Now, they're wanting NATO to take over. They're trying to make out like NATO is the one that can do it all. Well, they can't. They, can't. they got to have the assistance of the United States. I always remember the greatest majority of funding that goes into uh, NATO uh, is by the United States. Um, uh, let's see here. And we can come home. He said, speaking of the U.S. soldiers in Iraq, largely, or largely, well, let me start in a quote, and we can come home or largely come home and use NATO, you know, in other words, to be the, the stability uh, force in there. 
And, of course, he goes on in that article talking about, you know, what their plan is to eliminate the Islamic State. And um, uh, let's see, if you look down to, well, verse 13, uh, he's past this, reading out of the article and he says, emphasize the value of NATO increasing its role in preventing conflict. Um, preventing con conflict, Pastor says, well, that sounds great, and preserving peace, that sounds great in the Middle East, according to the White House, but we know that the only solution is the peaceful solution and bringing forth peace between all of these countries there. Um, now, let's see here. Let's go down... Um, um, okay, now he gets to a point uh, there in verse 14 where he's reading uh, the earlier article in 14, and it's, it, you know, he says, NATO right, and then you have the ME of the Middle East. He told the reporters excitedly, writing in the air with his finger, you call it NATO me. What a beautiful name. I'm good at names, okay? The, the Pope's army and the Middle East, Trump and the Middle East, don't forget this, Netanyahu, you know, which now he brings Netanyahu into the picture, uh, Netanyahu calls for a unity government, a unity government, and this is where pastor is going to start in to unity in the house of Yahweh. A unity government, they know they need unity. Well, he calls for a unity government. That would annex uh, Jordan Valley. He wants unity to annex the Jordan Valley. Well, that was voted down, and he lost that proposal quickly. And, of course, this is increasing uh, the borders. What the, at that time, that's what they were looking at. That would, was part of Netanyahu's uh, agenda. Uh, that is what the world is doing. So he's getting through all, all of this. And, of course, now he's getting to a point where he, in this ser sermon, where he talks about the fact that the world doesn't understand the three days and the three nights in, um, in, in the scriptures when Yahshua was resurrected. So if you have the book, uh, in verse 18, Pastor starts, and he says, if everybody would write this down, that's in Radio Land. And you preachers too. You preachers, I know I've argued with you for 50 years or more. So I know if I started it with you again, I already know your answers. Well, it was beginning to dawn toward the first day of the week when Mary came to the grave. If you have a Webster's Dictionary, if you don't uh, get, get you one, and you could go to the library and look it up, look up the word dawn. And, of course, this is the basics of learning how pastor has always taught by deciphering things but getting to the point to bring it about okay uh if you have a webster's dictionary and if you don't get one look at the word dawn and this will help you a great deal because you're thinking that dawn is sun up when the sun starts coming up now he goes further in genesis 2 1 through 3 uh yahweh said the days one through seven and of course uh, for the sake of time he gets he goes through Leviticus 23 showing the feast days and the fact that the Sabbath is also a feast day but um, down a little bit further in 19 he says it will never change one two three four five six seven seven is the day Yahweh rested and blessed there won't be another one so there what he did was he, he got it in their minds to know when the day starts and, of course, when the day ends so that they can understand later on when he talks about uh, the Sabbath and the fact that uh, uh, in verse 22, Miriam uh, uh, came to the grave and it was dawning towards the first day of the week, meaning that Yahshua was resurrected on the Sabbath because he was already gone and the fact was, was that was bringing forth the end of that day, the seventh day Sabbath. So it was dawning into the first day of the week. Um, and then he goes, look up the word dawn. 
it has sun rising because that's what the Christians put in there. But further down, but listen to the second definition, to begin to appear. To begin to appear. Um, now, uh, further down, let's see here. Now, let's listen to the next definition. Okay. Uh, on verse 23, uh, in verse 23, Pastor says, you could begin to see what, where you're wrong, you know, speaking to the religions of the world. They didn't come there as the sun was rising. They came there at the end of the Sabbath as it was, as it was perceived and understood that the Sabbath was ending and the first day was beginning at evening sundown on the Sabbath. Okay? Now, now he goes into the meat of the sermon here uh, with, the, um, uh, with unity. Okay? And in verse 24... Pastor says, now, on the unity, here's, here's our unity. You know, he's given you a little bit of a description in the news articles of what the governments of the world claim they work for, peace by force. You know, they have no unity. You know, their, their whole thing is taking over, uh, lusting, greeting after everybody else's country and wealth. Okay, so... Again, Pastor says, now on the unity, here's our unity. This is what Yahshua meant when he said in Matthias 16, 18, I'm going to build my house. He was talking about the prophecies in Micaiah 4, 1 through 4, and Isaiah 2, 2, uh, where Yahweh said, in the last days, I will build my house. Okay, now go down a little bit further in that uh, uh, paragraph of that verse. And Pastor says, I will establish my house, you know, in the last days. That's a time period. Uh, as I'll show you, like the word generation and the particular word that Yahshua used because he used a special word, special word for this word, generation. The unity, he says, it will be on unity. Everything in the house of Yahweh is built on unity, the laws and the prophecies and as taught by the one sent. Okay, um, now further down in verse 25 there, uh, Pastor says, Well, Yahshua calls it, calls it his house too. Then he said in the other scriptures that the branch would actually establish his house, but it's done through Yahshua and Yahweh, Yahweh being the first always. Okay, and then he gives us that example in Matthias 16, 18, he says, And I also say to you, he's speaking to the apostle Kepha, who are Kepha, whose name means rock. That rock, Yahweh, is our rock. That upon this rock, Yahweh unity. So you see, first, you know, to, to be in any kind of unity with Yahweh's laws and prophecies, we've got to know and understand that Yahweh is the rock, he's the source of all knowledge, and we have to be in unity with Yahweh. Um, okay, that upon this rock, Yahweh unity, that's what it means, Yahweh unity. I will build this house, this family, the family of Yahweh, the house of Yahweh, and the gates of Sheol, the grave, that's death, means death and burial, put you put you away, turn you back to dust. No, that's not going to be this time. It will not prevail against it. This time, this era, this last three and a half year period in the great house of Yahweh. Okay, in verse 27, uh, Pastor says, the unity that is coming, it's already started in Micaiah 4, 1 through 3, in the last days I will establish my house, uh, then they'll preach this message of the kingdom uh, to all of the world. Then the end will come, speaking of this time period. Um, now, uh, go a little bit further down. Um, you know, Pastor talks about the fact that the house of Yahweh started very small. I can't remember exactly how small, how many people were sitting on the patio at the homestead when Jacob and I dedicated the work here in Abilene 
where Yahweh brought me in 1967. And I'll end on this scripture right here. Pastor says, this right here, if you show that right there, showing on the monitor, can you see it? Yeah, it's right. Over one million viewers watch you women last week bring the message. One man, I, I reached over to shut his mouth because it was wide open over that statistic. He wrote this beautiful email. I could read it. Let's see, is that a child talking about Yahweh? Awesome. You know, these were all comments here. So, you know, Pastor ends right there, and he says, uh, uh, we love the house of Yahweh. We love our children. Yes, that is very obvious. Do what Yahweh tells you. I'll love you forever. Uh, these are our children, my children. Some of them are your children, but they're all my children too. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and end there, and I'm going to turn it over to the second speaker. Shabbat Shalom. Please be seated. You know all this talk about unity. If you think about it, the unity that the world has is opposite of the unity that we have. The leaders in the house of Yahweh, and you're all part of that leadership, the leaders in the house of Yahweh are the peacemakers. They're the ones who teach peace, not war. We're leaders, we're not rulers. But in the world, if you notice, the leaders of the world are the warmongers. They want nothing more than to have a nuclear war right now. That's not what the people in the countries really desire. If you just think back when we were out there before we came to the house of Yahweh or that full knowledge, all we wanted was people to leave us alone. The government, just leave us alone. Let us farm, let us have a mechanic shop, you know, whatever. They can't do that. It's, it's always coercion. Choices aren't able to be made. The unity that they have brings destruction. The unity that we have here at the house of Yahweh is the only thing that brings forth life. And life most abundant. And we have to understand and realize what life is. And that's what pastor's teaching us about this unity. You look around this room at one another, and you are a picture of unity from the youngest to the oldest. And that's amazing because we didn't always, we weren't always this way. But we are now because of the one sent, because one man stood on these 613 laws that the world teaches are done away with. So they'll, they'll never have unity because there's, there's nothing to unify or glue people together except these laws and these ways. So verse 31, he says, this is all done in unity. It's all done in great unity. He was talking about the children teaching and, and lifting up the children. He says, there's no conflict in the house of Yahweh. There is no conflict in the house of Yahweh. We have counselors we can go to when we have something that we might disagree with or disagree about with one another. We have a system established to bring forth unity no matter what. That's not offered anywhere but here. Only in the house of Yahweh. We're bringing forth the laws from the smallest child who wants to teach. And they have to want to teach or we wouldn't let them up here on the stage. All of us, we have to want to teach. Pastor says in verse 33, well, the unity, Micaiah 4 and then Matthew 16, that's unity. I brought out and mentioned it, the 6,000-year period that was given to mankind. 
Well, we're over 6,000 years. You add up 4,004 to 2019, and you get a higher number. You get 6,023. A lot of things have to go into this sermon. I don't know when I'll get to it, but I will get to it, the whole thing eventually. And, and Pastor goes on, and he, in verse 35, he says, the end. You add up the numbers, and you get 6,023. Well, it didn't start with 4,004. That was the beginning. Eve had Cain, and then she had Abel. These two were taught by their parents. They were two priests. It says nothing about Adam being a priest. Notice how here a little, there a little, Pastor starts dropping things in his sermon to get us all to think. Priest Abel, righteous Abel, whose blood was shed by evil. God worshiping Cain, who was following gods, the evil gods. I know that most preachers miss that in Genesis 3, 5, where it says that Satan denied what Yahweh said. Remember, Yahshua said Satan was a liar. She was the beginning of lying, the beginning of liars. She can't tell the truth. She can't bring forth the truth. Well, she convinced Eve to sin, and the mother convinced Cain to sin. Adam seemed to be keeping Abel pretty straight, and Abel became a righteous priest of Yahweh, and Cain became an unrighteous priest. Quite an interesting pattern. So when we choose to lie, who are we imitating? And why would we lie? Why do people lie? To conceal something? To hide something about themselves? Or to lift themselves up? Make themselves bigger people than they really are? Why? Why lie? We made a mistake, so we're ashamed to admit we made a mistake? So we lie about it? Is that, we really, is that really what we want our children learning and the children teaching others? I don't think so. Because look at what it leads to. Verse 36, where Cain went wrong was, he saw Abel exceeding him, his younger brother exceeding him. And he became very angry, but he never really thought about they could just work together. That didn't even enter Cain's mind. In any of the writings we've seen, that didn't even enter into his mind. What if Yaakov would have done that to Pastor? He was the older brother, right? And the one, the spokesman, was exceeding him? Because they could both see prophecy. Jacob is the one that realized, remember, Pastor told us, he asked Pastor the question. You think we're the two witnesses? He might not have understood everything that Pastor understands today, but in his time, when he was around, he understood quite a bit because they worked together. It's why the priest worked together. It's why we teach peace. We don't teach lying, cheating, stealing. The unity that glue, the laws of Yahweh, is what brings forth life. It's where the breath of life and the, the, the living waters come forth from. It's how they're sustained. See, both of them worked together. Both of them could have worked together, but it didn't occur that way. 
if you start thinking how it could have occurred, you can come up with all kinds of things. But there has to be unity. To bring forth unity, there has to be unity on the mother's side as well as on the father's side. There has to be unity. You can't defend a child when he wants to act like an idiot and blame his father. This was what was taking place with Cain. You can teach the child. You can teach the child. That's what we're told to do. Teach our children diligently. It's still up to them to make the choice. It's not our place to make the choice for any of the, of the brothers or sisters. We can teach. We can encourage. But we don't force. We don't take away someone's ability or opportunity to make the choice themselves. Yahweh doesn't make my choices, though sometimes maybe that wouldn't be a bad thing. But he's teaching us how to make those righteous choices. It's still up to them to make the choice, but you can always have your voice ringing in their heads that what you told them earlier they should have done or should do. You can't keep them from going out and making mistakes. This is what occurred with those two boys. They were taught. How long were they taught? It doesn't say except here a little and there a little. And pastor goes on and he starts talking about the 26 years. He said, so in 2019, we have three and a half years left of a 26-year period. Now, where did I get that? Six months, six day, 2019, they failed to sign a waiver of the peace agreement. They failed to sign it. This peace agreement was signed 9-13-93. 9-13-93. It stayed in operation three and a half years, meaning after it was shut down, we still had three and a half years to go. They failed to sign the waiver that kept the peace agreement on pause. They had to sign it by 6-6-2019. Otherwise, the peace agreement would have gone back into effect as it was signed 9-13-93 and started 10-13-93. Now that's three and a half years. Now look at 60-23 or 6,023 and add three years to it. You got that? Add the two numbers, 4004 and 2019. 2019 was when they failed to sign it. From that date, you will still have three and a half years left. Those three and a half years are prophesied to be cut short. So that makes it less than three and a half years. But still, if we figure three years and see what it brings it to, you see what it brings it to. Add three to 6,023, and that would be 6,026. 4,004 plus 2019 equals 623. 623 plus 3 equals 626. If we take the time that Yeshua was born, well, it wasn't when he was born that makes the difference, but it was when he started preaching. Because when he started preaching, tells us how old Abel was when Yahweh allowed him to start being a priest. If you look at it, there's a first Abel and a last Abel. In 26 AY, Yeshua was baptized by Yachanan. If you write this down, you can explain it later. 26 AY is when Yeshua was baptized by Yachanan. This is Matthew 3.13. I want to turn over there I don't want to slip up here. I'll be explaining the rest of my life if I do. Matthew 3.13, if you'll look up at the top of chapter 3, it says 26 AY. Yeshua was 26 years old. So by this now, you can connect. Abel being the first Abel, 
and Yeshua being the last Abel. See, Abel also started his preaching at 26 years old. Matthew 3.13, he says, Then Yeshua came from Galilee to the yard in Diakonon to be baptized by him. By him. Be baptized by Yachanan. Then in Matthew 4.1, Yeshua was sent out to be tempted. That, that was 27 A.Y. He had just been baptized, and he went out to be tempted or be taken in temptation. Has anybody ever been tempted to go out and make money? Anybody ever been tempted with holding a worldly office? At one time or another, I'm sure we all had have had that temptation. And that's what the beast, the beastly system was offering, what the adversary was offering Yeshua. Look at verse 46. Well, he was tempted. Yeshua was tempted. He turned it all down and said, I don't want any part of it. Worldly riches, fame, and everything went with it there, as we see in the next six verses. Now, in the same year, 27 A.Y., look at Matthew 5, 2, and he opened his mouth and taught. Verse 2, he opened his mouth and taught. He taught before that. It's like Jacob and I. His name was J.G., we were in college, and I told you this before. We sent out letters to the churches, and he went through all of that. You know, he re-explained all of this. And in 48, he says, now we were led. I didn't know that then, but I know it now. We were led to Nimrod, of all places, to a community building named Romney, not too far from here. He said, I think it's on Highway 183. And he goes through... And he talks about how old, you know, he goes through the whole thing that they taught. 49, that was the time also in that building that Jacob and I baptized each other. We'd already been baptized, but it was in Lord or God. So we baptized each other in the name of Yahweh through Yeshua, our high priest. I believe, I do believe that was in 61. It might have been 62, but I think it was 61. I know I was 26 years old. And that's the point. That's the subject of all of this. Yeshua was 26. Pastor was 26. When they were baptized and when they began teaching, there's a pattern being followed here. Abel as well. In 51, Pastor says, the last sentence, he says, but I know I was 26 years old. Abel, Yahweh's righteous priest, was 26 years old. There's a bunch more than this that goes with this scripture, but he was 26 years old. And 26 years, or add 26 years there to 6,000, and you got it. Instead of 23, put 26, and you got it. You've got 6,000 years starting when Abel started preaching and down through the last three and a half years of great tribulation, that's going to be cut short. I don't know how short it will be cut, but I know it will be cut short. And we all know why it's going to be cut short. Lest no flesh could be saved. Think about how pastor explained this morning how Yahweh Yahweh's mercy there was no way he would allow mankind to have the ability or the opportunity to have eternal life with all of the misery that man's way brought forth in man's life Sometimes parents have to make very tough decisions in their family, heads. I'm sure every decision pastor makes is not the easiest decision to make. But pastor will always choose the plan of Yahweh first. That's how he thinks. How, how will this decision affect the plan of Yahweh? 
Will it move it forward? Or will it move it backwards? And when we don't necessarily appreciate a decision that pastor makes, or we question ourselves, why did he do that? Could it be because we are not thinking through the plan of Yahweh like pastor is? I think so. He's the only one who knows the plan of Yahweh as intimately as he does. More so than any other human being ever in the history of mankind. And we get to sit at his feet every week. And some of you get to talk to him every day. You hear some kind of wisdom coming forth from that man doing your work, your part of the work, some of you every day. It's amazing the time, what time it is that we live in. Every other human being saw the one sent in dreams and visions, and we walk with him. We can wave at him when he drives down the road, Abel Way. We can see him up here every Sabbath for quite a while now, right? Praise Yahweh. No other humans ever had that opportunity. Only us. We get to see him face to face. We get to marvel that he goes out and works on a tractor, got his suit on, and he doesn't sweat. What's up with that? He's amazing. And we get to hear him day after day. We get to watch how he leads the people. Always remember that. And with that, if you'll all raise your hands, we'll close in prayer. Most holy and righteous, Heavenly Father Yahweh, this is Colin Shmuel Hawkins. Along with these, your sons, Father, begging permission to come before you as seed of the last day's witness, the great Quan, yes, we're able Hawkins, and through our most ahab, an honorable high priest and king, Yeshua Messiah. Father, we thank you for the books of Israel. We thank you for the house of Yahweh, for the one sent and for the opportunity to be able to call him the one you sent for us, to be able to call him our teacher, our leader, the one that we sought after, Father. Seek first the kingdom of Yahweh and his righteousness. We thank you for opening our hearts and our minds to how these laws bring forth life and how we can be peacemakers we can always be in self-control and never be selfish. We never, ever, Father, have to be a ruler like those in the world. We do a hobby, Father, and thank you for Pastor and for each one of us. We thank you for one another, Father, and pray that you continue this work, this great work, and that we put forth every effort to come into unity with your 613 laws as well as within, with one another as brothers and as sisters, Father. We do ask these things of you, thanking you for them in unity with the body of priests of the house of Yahweh. As seed of the last day's witness, the great kindness for Abel Hawkins, and through our most ahabed and honorable high priest and king, Yeshua Messiah, we thank you. Hallelujah, Yahweh. Praise Yahweh.